I'd like us this morning to open our Bibles to Romans chapter 8 from verse 31. De vas a decirme que a tus pistolipros romeos que fallan ita a tu edafio 31. Ti selida den den echo, signome. Selida hilia. Romans chapter 8 from verse 31. Romeos ita a tu edafio 31. And the Apostle Paul says here, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God and who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul here begins with an interesting question. And his question is, if God is for us, who can be against us? It's a strange question because when we look at the world in which we live and they lived back then, there's a lot of things that are against us. He's writing to Christians and as a Christian in this world, you'd be worried about all the things that are happening, not in the sense of losing your confidence or trust in the Lord, but because if God is with us, there's still so many things that are against us. We're living in a world that's becoming more and more anti-God as it it seeks to destroy every principle that God has given us by which to live our lives. And so there's a lot of things that stand against us and sometimes, you know, the values, the political system, we can have an issue with a lot of these things and even at times we may feel that God is with us, nothing seems to go our way. You know, we don't get that lucky break that sometimes we desire. But Paul's focus here wasn't how bad the world is, how terrible the situation is and all these things that surround us he was focused on a much more important issue, a much, more, uh, a much greater issue than all that. And this issue begins in the first chapter of Romans where he describes the situation of man. And we don't have time to go through the whole book of Romans. It's an amazing book which describes man's plight, God's response, and the, the climax in a sense here in this chapter, how a man who is born in sin and is broken before God, can stand before God with no condemnation because of Jesus Christ. And he says back in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The anger of God, the wrath of God, is on people, on man, who lives an unrighteous and ungodly life, who practices sin, and only that, in practicing his sin, they suppress the truth, they're not interested in hearing the truth because man is so consumed by doing what he thinks will give him pleasure, uh, will give him fulfillment, and in doing so, he lives a life that's unrighteous or ungodly uh, before a righteous and a holy God. And Paul says, because of that, God's wrath is poured out upon man. And Someone would argue, well, you know, some people don't know about God. How can God be so angry against them if they're living in ignorance? And Paul Paul says, I did all these things in ignorance. But when Paul was saying that, he was talking about his zeal for God and how misguided his zeal for God was in doing all the things that he did. And he doesn't hide the fact, even though he lived in ignorance, I was a murderer of the saints. And here Paul tells us, that the wrath of God is revealed against those who practice unrighteousness. And the reason why 
the wrath of God is revealed on those who practice unrighteousness, Paul also tells us in the same verse, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. So what Paul is saying is sin is a choice we make. No one forces us to make it. And it's a choice we make, and sin is an act of rebellion against God. And we all know that's what it is when we do it, because we're born with a conscience that's given to us by God, and that conscience tells us what you're doing is wrong. And that conscience also tells us you should be doing this, which is right. It's a God-given conscience. And so within us, from the time we're born, we're born with this conscience that tells us we are right or we're wrong. Now, over time, we destroy our conscience. Man destroys his conscience. Paul says some people's conscience is seared. It doesn't feel anything anymore. And that's a consequence of not turning our lives to God, but turning away from God. And that's why God's wrath is revealed on man, because though he knows what the right thing to do is, but God has shown it to him, that's what Paul says, he chooses to do what is wrong. And in choosing to do what is wrong, he falls short of the standard that God provides. Now, ignorance is not an excuse because we have this conscious within us, consciousness within us which tells us and points us to what is right. Now, a lot of people don't see themselves that bad and that's the human condition because you can always find a worse example of yourself. Remember the Pharisee in the temple raised his hand and said, God, I, I thank you so much. I'm not like that tax collector. We can all do that. But God, Paul here, brings our attention back to the story about us and God and says in Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, none of us uh, are innocent. None of us are off the hook. Before God, we all fall short of the standard of God. And God's grace, Paul tells us again, is revealed to us through Jesus Christ in Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love uh, for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so Paul brings together our brokenness, brings together God's righteousness and says those things meet at the cross where Jesus Christ died for us and he dealt with the penalty of our sin. Because the sentence that was cast by God, Paul tells us in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So while this is our brokenness and this is man's situation, he's guilty before God and he's going to experience the wrath of God in his life, that's what we've earned as sinners in this world. There's a free gift that comes from God and that free gift is eternal life and it's through Jesus Christ. And that's, in a, in a, in a few words, that is the story of the gospel, that salvation is available to every person that would come to Jesus Christ who sees their brokenness and sees that they fall so short of the standard of God that there is no excuse in their lives and they come to the Lord Jesus Christ to receive salvation. But Paul here isn't interested in stopping at that point, which for us is such an amazing thing. How can God dwell within us, want to dwell within us? What is it that would make God love us so much to send his only son to die on the cross for us? You know, we, we have difficulty understanding that, but for Paul, the story doesn't stop there. That's the beginning of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a starting point for having a relationship with Jesus Christ, accepting salvation, recognizing our sinfulness, and accepting the salvation that comes from Jesus. And Paul goes on again in Romans to say, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? We cannot continue as we were before. Because now we're children of God. We've been purchased for a price. And not only that, there's a work that's continuing in our lives through the Holy Spirit to take us who are broken, destroyed by sin, and still suffer the consequences of that in our lives today as Christians, to take us and to conform us to the image of his Son. To me, that's such a humbling thought that God would send his Son not for a friend, not for some sort of relative, not for someone he owed a favour to, but for rebellious sinners like us, like me, and not stop at dealing with the issue of my sin so that my life would be spared, but then to continue to seek to work in my life 
to conform me into the image of his son. So when he looks at me, he doesn't see my brokenness. That's always before me. I always see my brokenness. And as a, as, a, as a Christian, I still see how broken I am, how much work God has to do in my life. But to see that he wants to take that and to conform it to the image of his son. And to come to this chapter, in the beginning, the beginning of this chapter, to say there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus and who remain in Christ Jesus, who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ took my place, our place, and died for our sin. We put him there. Our sin put him there. He took our place. And he adopted us as his children. And we have all that story unfolding in the first chapter of Ephesians. All the blessings then come because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And the continuing work of the Holy Spirit to, pres to preserve us until the day that Jesus Christ comes to take us to be with him. And so Paul here asks a series of questions. And the questions he asks are quite significant questions. The first question is, what then shall we say to these things? What is there to say now that we've heard all this, the plan of salvation unfolding and all the work that the Lord wants to do in our lives? What more is there to say? It's like Paul is saying, have I left something out? Is there something we haven't covered? And the human mind struggles because it's mind-boggling what God is trying to do in my life and your life today because of Jesus Christ. How can a holy and just and righteous God want to save a sinner like me? And I want to save a sinner like me but to sanctify me and to conform me into the image of his son. Can it really be that simple? Am I missing something out? Is that how simple the gospel message is? Am I oversimplifying it? Surely there's something I must do. It's like Paul is saying, have we left something out? Tell me, have I left something out? Is there something I haven't really covered? And he asks a series of questions to remind us, or to tell us rather, he hasn't left anything out. He's told us the full truth, the full story, the whole meaning of the gospel message, the whole meaning of the Easter message for those who don't hear it often, maybe once a year. He hasn't left anything out. And the, first, the second question he asks is, if God is for us, who can be against us? Because our biggest need was dealt with by God through Jesus Christ. In dealing with our sin, he gave his son to die on the cross and on the cross, he carried my sin and my shame. He died for me. Once alienated, but now a child of God. If God is for us, who can be against us? And he goes on to say, in verse 32, He did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How shall not he with him also freely give us all things? If he gave us his son, and that was the starting point of our relationship with Jesus Christ, is there anything he will not give us? Pointing to the fact that we started with Jesus. And that's not the end of the road. The road continues until the day we get to eternity, to eternal glory. And if God dealt with that issue of, that separated us from God and gave his son, Paul asks us to think, is there anything that he won't give us? The second question, and really the first question is a rhetorical question. Is there anything he won't give us? He gave us his son. Is there anything that he can't give us if he's given us his only son and freely give it to us? The next question, he says, who shall bring a charge against God elect? We find that in verse 33. If it's God who proclaims death on a sinner, for the wages of sin is death, there is none righteous, no, not one. If it's he who proclaims uh, judgment on the sinner and it's he who provides the solution to the problem of sin through Jesus Christ our brokenness is constantly before us, I said this before sometimes it robs us of our confidence in God but if this has been dealt with then God who brought the charge it's God also who justifies me in Jesus Christ so I don't stand guilty before God anymore here's the one I stood guilty before because he dealt with that guilt through Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to the next question. Who is he who condemns? In John we read, The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So it was Christ before whom I stood in judgment. It was he who condemned. In fact, it was my sin that condemned me before God. 
but he's no longer standing in, char- in, in judgment. He's no longer charging me for sin. He's no longer condemning me because he died for my sin. And this is the great news of Easter. This is the salvation message, the gospel message that's avail- that salvation is available to all through Jesus Christ. But Paul is not content to stop there. And as grand and as wonderful as this message is, a lot of Christians stop there. I'm saved. Praise God. Hallelujah. But Paul is not content to stop there. Because he goes on to tell us in verse 34, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. But there's something more he tells us. Can there be anything more than that? Is there anything grander than that? And furthermore, is also risen. And furthermore, in addition, there's something else. Uh, more than that, he is risen. And the whole song of Paul throughout the New Testament is, we worship a risen Saviour. The world remembers him once a year, but we remember him every day because our relationship is not with someone who rests in a tomb. Our relationship is with a risen Saviour. And so Paul here wants to tell us there's something much more important than just celebrating our forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And that is important. And what's more important is the work hasn't finished. His work in my life and your life is continuing today. And as concerned as we should be about sin in our lives, we should also be concerned about what Jesus Christ is trying to do in your life and my life because he is resurrected. That's what we did to Jesus. We put him on the cross. And if the cross is where everything finished, then everything else in the New Testament falls apart. Because everything else in the New Testament rests on the fact that we have a resurrected Saviour. If it wasn't for the resurrection, our accuser would be before God day and night, as he is now, and there'd be no response from the other side. But Paul tells us something very important here, that Jesus Christ is risen, and it says in verse 34, He is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. His work began at the cross. Our salvation was completed at the cross. But today he's still working, making intercession for us. And every time we attempted by sin, and every time we look left and right to see what the world has to offer, let's remember the Lord who died on the cross for our sin is by the Father making intercession for us. In 1 John 2, 1 we read, My little children, these things are right to you. So you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The problem of sin was dealt with at the cross, our guilt, the penalty of sin. But the problem of sin hasn't gone away. And today we have an advocate by the Father, next advocate by the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, ready to forgive those who come and repent of their sin. And even as a child of God, because that's who John is writing to, we shouldn't sin. We must not sin, but if we do, we have an advocate by the Father. In Hebrews 7.25 we read, Therefore he, also made, he, he also, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost, as, as, to the infinite extent he can save us. Save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's continuing to work in your life and mine. Because he wants to transform me and you into the image of his own, of Jesus Christ. God continues to work in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And we have it again in Hebrews, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but in all points tempted as we we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because he lives, we can face today and we can face tomorrow. And that's why Paul can get to the end of this chapter and ask the final question, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? He has a long list here of things in this world, out of this world, close things, distant things. And says none of those things can separate us from the love of Christ because Jesus Christ is next to the Father, making intercession for us. And the question that really that remains for us is, this resurrected Saviour, and we're celebrating his resurrection today again, this resurrected Saviour, 
he rose and his work continues in my, he wants to, he needs, his work he wants to continue his work in your life and mine and the only barrier is not the things in this world but the things around us this big list of things that Paul says uh, may can't separate us from the love of Christ the only thing that stands as a barrier is my heart that says enough Lord I'm okay where I am and God the Father says no you're not I want you to be in the image of my son you have to look like him that's how I want you to be so the question for us remains are we going to interfere with the work that God wants to do that started at the cross and won't be completed until the day he comes because in Philippians we read being confident of this very thing that he who began the good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ he wants to complete this good work in us but we have to submit our lives to a resurrected saviour that the tomb is empty we don't have a Christian Mecca so to speak we can face and yeah that's when we feel religious Jesus Christ lives in our heart through the presence of the Holy Spirit along with the Father continually wanting to, continually wanting to work in us to conform us to the image of the Son will you and I submit to his will will you and I allow him to do what he wants to do in our lives to make us more Christ like will you and I say to him yes Lord your will be done in my life and shut our eyes to all the things that are happening around us all the voices in the world around us that distract us knowing that the work he began he wants to complete his desire is that he completes that work so our entry into heaven will be glorious I need to say a few words to those who are not in Christ Jesus today the tomb is empty he left he died on the cross he was resurrected and he left and he's coming again. How are we going to meet the one who gave everything through his son to die on the cross for you, to reconcile you with God? How are you going to meet him if you haven't yet given your heart to Jesus Christ? How are you going to stand before him and say, I didn't know, when he says, I showed it to you. I revealed it all to you. How are you going to stand before him and say, I wasn't ready yet. What were you waiting for? I gave my son. Was there anything freely that I wouldn't give to you? How are you going to stand before him when he says in his word, Today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. May God help us understand this Sunday that Jesus Christ was resurrected, not to make us feel warm and fuzzy Easter, uh, on Easter, but to remind us that the work he began in our hearts he wants to complete and may we submit our lives to him so he can complete that work may god bless his word in our hearts amen we'll continue with uh, another song in english